I'm delighted to say that Rick Parry, the man uh, in charge, really, of the Football League as chairman of the EFL to help sort and guide all of this through. Uh, Rick and uh, Andrew and Gavin, a very good evening to all of you, uh, first of all. Uh, Rick, if I just before I even come and talk about all of this, a touch of class from Liverpool with uh, Sven Joran Eriksson this weekend. That was that that was really shows what our football's about, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. Wonderful afternoon. Great. Now, firstly, what would be the first thing that you would now like to say to fans of EFL clubs as to how you are going to help them going forward? Well, we've been trying our level best to help them uh, over the last few years. I think the... Um, regulator from our point of view is going to be a huge step um, it's going to be different for clubs it's going to present challenges um, but the EFL has been supportive throughout the process we engage constructively with Tracy Crouch during the fan-led review uh, we have welcomed the government's white paper and we have welcomed the bill um, because from our point of view our purpose is making clubs sustainable um, and many of them aren't sustainable in, in the current climate um, and what we're trying to do in that is to secure, as I said, long-term sustainability, make the clubs resilient from fans' point of view, make sure their clubs exist and aren't going to be facing financial catastrophe all the time. The tension, of course, there and the paradox we've got to grapple with uh, with the fans is of course the fans want to see their club sustainable but most of all they want to see their club successful and of course if it's a question of who owns those clubs and who are the directors of those clubs they want to reach the promised land of either the championship and possibly the premier league one day yeah, absolutely. And and nothing wrong with ambition because that's what the sport is all about. Uh, but as I said, from the FL's point of view, what we're trying to do is to make sure that clubs can rise and fall up and down the pyramid without facing catastrophe. And the problem at the moment is there there are just too many fault lines. It's just it's it's too difficult getting upwards. And again, when you when you fall back out of the Premier League, um we need a softer landing. We need we need to close gaps. We need to uh, we need to have fairer shares. And what we definitely can't have is the unfair competition that we have in the Championship created by the parachute payments. We we have to level that playing field. And just one final one at this, and then Gavin and Andrew will come in, I'm sure, as well, and we'll we'll all talk <coughs> and discuss this in detail. Is um, what, what for you do you want to see and your relationship be when, whether it's 25, 2025 or 26, when the regulator comes in? What's your role for fans of a club like mine, Cambridge United? So I, I think that um, from the FL's perspective, as I said, we, we're going to work constructively with the regulator. Um, we... Uh, there, are, there are going to be unknowns, um, but the regulator is there to ensure that individual clubs are more resilient. It's there to ensure that the, the game, the pyramid, is more resilient. It is there to ensure that fans have a greater say, greater input um, to their club's plans, that heritage assets are protected. So there's an awful lot of really, really good stuff in there. It's something that we're embracing and looking forward to. Um, it, it is going to be different, it is going to be challenging and, it, and in a sense the game should be hanging its head in shame because we've had 30 years to sort it out ourselves and we haven't proved capable of doing so. Um, but as I said, we're, um, we're actually really looking forward to a bright new future mm. under a new regime. One of the difficulties of course, uh, uh, Gavin uh, and Andrew as well here, Gavin I'll come to you first, is that <coughs> you have um, various different people who, in whatever business and however they've done it, uh, they they think they're successful enough or have got enough about them to take over a club if one becomes available or they're going to do this and spend to get something that they 
possibly don't really have uh, the uh, financial acumen to uh, get together but all have a go that means this is still going to have to be um, looked at uh, in a very sympathetic way with the game and the the clubs themselves and that fan base yeah you're absolutely right mark and first of all i want to say to rick uh, well done uh for coming on tonight i think it shows great transparency and openness to fans that you're doing this sort of thing and uh well done as well for keeping our clubs together, the EFL, through the last few years, because I know it's been difficult. Um, what I would say, Mark, with all of this, is that I think we're looking at this absolutely positively in terms of fan engagement and things like owners and directors tests, which I'm sure Rick and even the PL would be delighted to get rid of because it's a nightmare uh, and it costs a fortune. And by the way, the idea that this regular is going to cost 10 million quid is a joke. It's going to cost way more than that if it's looking into many cases of owners, etc. But the thing that worries me, the big thing that worries me, is if you look at the government press release, you've got Rishi Sunak talking about the unscrupulous owners in football. You've got them talking about 64 clubs since the Premier League coming in, gone into administration, but only seven of those in the last 10 years. So the trend's downwards. Mm -hmm. And I just would say we need to be really careful here about talking the game and the owners down because we'll actually really hurt um, the EFL owners particularly, um, the opportunities for other people to come in and invest in clubs. I think that's dangerous. I think there's been a lot of political dog whistling from politicians jumping on this. And I hope that a regulator will get it right because it needs to be, and they've talked about a light touch. They've talked about advocacy first approach, but it <coughs> needs to be. You need to let the football people be at the forefront of this, don't they, Rick? Or there's going to be dangers. Hmm. Rick? Football people, light yourself at the front to sort this out. That's what's needed. I think it's a balance. And um, inevitably, there's been some rhetoric. But I think if you actually read the bill, uh, it's a really thorough piece of work. It's been well put together. Uh, it's, it's hardly been rushed. It's been um, at least 12 months in the making. And um, in terms of it's like touch approach in terms of the requirements on the regulator to liaise with the leagues. Um, I think it's, listen, proof of the pudding is going to be in who's appointed because the regulator is going to have wide discretion. Um, you touched on owners and directors. Um, not just would it be nice from the league's point of view to be able to get rid of some of the work, but I think one of the big pluses, for example, when it comes to owners and directors is the statutory powers that a regulator will have to gather information, uh, the penalties for clubs, should they provide false information, mm -hmm. will be potentially criminal. Um, so I think we're going to see greater transparency because football, in common with many sports, does like to live in the dark. Uh, for me, Transparency is absolutely at the core of good governance. And because this is going to be a public body, transparency will be at the centre. Um, so I think we're going to shine a light on many more problems. As I said the statutory powers, I think, are really incredibly helpful. Uh, and provided it is light touch and provided there is proper liaison with the leagues, then mm -hmm. I, I can see this actually adding um to the attractions of the game going forward so i think it can do us a great service when your owner comes to you andrew as he would have done that when it, you were working at uh, brentford and and, and what have you what, <coughs> what what is it that you want to see that the regulator will understand from individual clubs good evening gents um Look, I think it, I think it's a, I think it's an invidious position. I think it's a difficult, a very difficult job. However, having read the bill, and it, let, let's safe to say it's the first bill I've ever read from 137 cover to cover. pages. Yeah, it, I mean, again, it's it, uh, it, I did it over three nights. It wasn't particularly <laughs> exciting, and and nobody in the house wanted to join me. Um, <laughs> however, in doing so, and and Gavin will know. The first time I met Gavin it, was coming to consult with me when I was at Brentford. Um, the first time I, I ever spoke to Rick was was in trying to buy and loan players from Liverpool when I was at Charlton. So, you, you know, everybody everybody here tonight is is well versed in, in in football parlance. My initial thought was was not wanting government anywhere near um, a, a, a kind of football governance. However, as, as I think Rick alluded to earlier, you know. Football's had a long time to sort this out, and and for whatever reason hasn't. And if you ask me for whatever reason, for whatever reason is because 
it's very difficult to get people to think above their individual <coughs> necessity of their own business. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that it, therein lies back to where Gavin was suggesting is, you know, these, these businesses are, are reliant on being propped up or being driven by essentially an individual or a number of individuals who, you know, again, it takes significant sums. So, so they will always have an individualistic view. I actually, having read this, this bill now, genuinely think the things that it suggests it's going to get involved with would be extremely helpful mm. however i don't think it's a panacea i don't think it's a fix-all we have some significant issues with with distribution of funds within the leagues and 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 that's an, an argument that's been been kind of bubbling on for 20 years the interesting thing we have in 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 rick's position is that it's it's very difficult to overlook the 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 erosion of of the efl powers every time they've called for cash now yeah. rick's in a really interesting position and i don't mean to talk about you rick but rick's in a really interesting position is he was sat at the premier league when when mm. the efl and, and me as part of the executive were unfortunately uh focused into giving away many of the bedrock uh, uh, of the things that we could now be bargaining with so you know again i think it's understanding where we're at i think it is absolutely a benefit but i think as we've said week in week out and as and as rick and his executives are trying to fix the actual model itself is is kind of broken mm -hmm. so you're, you're nodding your head there rick uh, first of all your answer to that as well you, you you feel i mean you are in a good position having uh, you know had your position <coughs> at uh, one of the best um, greatest clubs uh, in the country and now very much uh, looking to what you can do percentage wise you're going for the 25 percent here aren't you for the efl straight off and and what have you but with what andrew was saying there is there going to be the will on all sides or is your job along with the regulator going to be pretty challenging it is going to be challenging. I, um, the only word I would challenge Andrew on is the model isn't kind of broken. The model is broken. The model really is broken mm -hmm. because, you know, if you go back to when we formed the Premier League in 1992, turnover of the Premier League was 45 million. Turnover of the FL was 34 million. A gap of 11 million, you know, bridgeable. The gap is now in excess of 3 billion. That's the gap, that's the chasm that we're trying to bridge. And we've touched a little bit on the dependence on owners, the reliance upon owners who are extraordinarily committed. Owner funding is brilliant until it isn't. And we're not so much concerned with the Berries, the Macclesfields, we're more concerned with what happens in the championship with the Derbys, the Boltons, the Reddings. You know, Mel Morris had a real go. Mel Morris came in. Who, who would have uh, ever thought that Mel Morris was anything other than a fantastic owner? Mm. £250 million pounds and failures to get into the Premier League later, and Mel's had enough. At which point, it's administration, the club falls off a cliff. Mm. Bolton, the same. Reading, we've seen the same. Dai Yong didn't come in as a bad owner. He came in and spent hundreds of millions in trying to get to the promised land and didn't. And then one day he decides he isn't going to fund anymore. Wigan, we had exactly the same. We had fan groups coming to us and saying, we'd love to take the club over. We said, brilliant. Have you got 15 million quid? Well, what do we need that for? Well, that will be your annual losses in the championship. Forget about buying the club. Mm -hmm. These are the imbalances. And getting this voted for within football is, is frankly an impossibility. So having that external influence, um, we think, is going to be extraordinarily important. And again, we've been trying in earnest for four years to talk redistribution with the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Government has been pushing both of us really, really hard to try and get a solution. We haven't done. We haven't even got close. And one of the things that I'm most excited about, really excited about with the bill, is the requirement for um, the state of the game review which will be the first comprehensive, transparent, wholly independent review of the finances of the game. And that will be what the regulator basically uses to set its objectives. So the sooner that state of the game review mm. is carried out from our perspective, we'd love to see that produced within the next six months. 
uh, because the output from that is going to be very revealing and incredibly useful. So what, what would you also say to the regulator uh, on this too, Rick, when it comes to <coughs> a Premier League that hasn't welcomed the regulator in the way that the EFL has? Uh, well, it's going to be law. So the regulator is going to have a significant amount of uh, power and responsibility. I'm sure any regulator worth their salt will want to engage with Premier League clubs because, again, for any well-run club or any club that's doing things half right, there isn't an awful lot to fear in here. Um, this isn't going to be necessarily draconian. Every fan should be consult every club rather should be consulting with their fan base. Mm. You know, wh why wouldn't they? We're not talking golden shares or fans on boards. We're talking about sensible um, consultation processes. And, and who could quarrel with that? We're talking about proper governance codes. Well, I mean, who could quarrel with proper governance? We have a sense of responsibility. You know, the, the game is massively important to the nation. So mm. why shouldn't we be governed properly? So, as I said, we should be embracing this and and collaborating, cooperating with the regulator yeah. and all making the best of it. Gav? Yeah, look, Rick, I think what you've said is really interesting and I agree with most of it. The, the thing I sort of always have a problem with is the EFL mindset that they just should be given the money from the Premier League. I had the problem when I was in the PL in the first place. And part of this comes, it's what you said, you know, it was only 10 million gap between the two divisions at the start. But that's because the Premier League's become the most phenomenally successful league on the planet. And the point is we should welcome that because the money is going to be coming down and solidarity payments have proven that. But what I would ask really is if more money comes in, and I know that you've been very vocal about the regulator, uh, but... And, and part of that is so you can get more income for the EFL clubs that you represent <coughs> and fair play for that. But if you get this big check from the Premier League in addition every year, how are you going to stop that becoming just inflation on players' wages and prices, which is causing the chaos in the championship as it is? So we're not looking for handouts. Let's just get that straight. This isn't the EFL putting its hand in the Premier League's pocket. This is all about rebalancing. And this is all about whether we value the pyramid. If we don't want promotion and relegation, you know, that's fine. But then that's how I look at the value of the Premier League then. It's the variety at the bottom, not just the, the success of the biggest clubs, that is the strength of the per Premier League. And if you look at the 14 clubs in the Premier League that have not been there since the start, on average, they've been in the Premier League for 13 years each. Now, that means... By definition, they've been in the EFL for 19 years each. If you look at the EFL, if you look at the 14 clubs who've had the longest period in the Premier League that are now in the EFL, how many years have they been in the Premier League? Well, 13, funnily enough. So they've made just as great a contribution to building the brand that is the Premier League as the clubs that are currently in it. So it's, you know, it's not their money this is about the pyramid and it's not about two leagues this is about really is about the 116 clubs that are part of the pyramid do you know luton when we were forming the premier league yeah. were in the first division they voted on the constitution of the premier league they played a real part never got into the premier league because they were relegated they've been down they've had a substantial spell in the national league now they're the 51st club to join the Premier League. Is that not what English football is all about? It's mm -hmm. all about balance. So, yeah, of course, the Premier League is a great success. We want our biggest and best clubs winning in Europe. But it's all about the pyramid uh, and giving clubs that ability to rise, as I said, without facing catastrophe. We are absolutely committed to proper cost control. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. We have introduced hard salary caps. Uh, we had a blip over the legality of the process. Um, our clubs in the championship have talked about uh, when we were discussing the potential offer from the Premier League, they were very much up for uh, putting limits on owner funding, reducing owner funding from 15 million a club to 5 million a club. And the point is, if you're going to make clubs sustainable, it needs two things. One is it needs redistribution because they're not solvent. But hand in hand with that, it needs better regulation. The, the two are inseparable. We have never said, give us money. We have said, 
let's reduce that dependence on owner funding, let's make the club solvent, and let's bring better regulation to make them sustainable and, in the long term. It's all about that total package. And th thank you for your time. Just one final question to you, Rick, um, and we are going to speak more uh, to others in, in the, the coming uh, 35 minutes left <laughs> in this hour. One, one thing for you, I mean, it's got cross-party support, so we're in an election year anyway. Are you hopeful that whoever it is comes in decides the sort of regulator that you can work with? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, we think this is going... Well, we hope this is going to proceed through Parliament relatively swiftly. It needs to be done before the election, mm -hmm. so... Um, we're not looking years away. We're looking months away. Yeah. Absolutely critical to appoint the right regulator, of course, with the right mix of skills. Um, probably somebody with uh, a lot of legal experience and knowledge, not necessarily a lawyer, but certainly uh, a real understanding because this is quite a complex bill. Um, somebody with objectivity. Uh, that's incredibly important. That right level of independence um but as i said when when the regulator comes in uh they'll they'll find that we are there ready to collaborate and cooperate rick parry thank you very much indeed for taking time out tonight to speak to us here on the sunday night club